At this time, we want to quickly get Julie Fitzpatrick from the Pennsylvania Downtown Center um, up to talk to you for a few minutes uh, on the details on planning a bid. Improvement districts, as they are in Pennsylvania. So, some of the things just to keep in mind, because we've heard a couple different terms um, mentioned this evening, that they can be known for lots of different things. They say a rose by any other name is an improvement district. A business, it can be called a business improvement district, district, a residential improvement district, and each of them has its own acronym. So we've got the BIDs, the RIDs, the NIDs, um, industrial improvement districts, institutional improvement districts, mixed use improvement districts, and then in Philadelphia we have special services district, and we have in New Jersey special improvement district, and in California a lot of the programs are known as community benefit districts. However, in Pennsylvania, we actually have a law that, specific, that was passed in 2000 that uh, specifically is um, really the overlier for improvement districts. And it's actually called the Neighborhood Improvement District Law. So, so what a business improvement district, a neighborhood improvement district is in its simplest form, it's an arrangement by which two or more property owners or businesses agree to share the cost of, of meeting some sort of common need and, two parts, to assume the responsibility for improving the environment that affects business profitability and property values. You know, it can be planned and run principally by the property owners and the tenants of the district. It's also a self-help device. It is about those within the district deciding what is ha gonna happen in the business district. It's not about anyone coming in and telling you what needs to be done, what should, should be done, what you have to do. It's really, about you as the stakeholders having a say in what's being done in the improvement district. And as we all mentioned um, in the earlier presentations, it is based off of parcel specific inventory. So it's not just about creating a boundary that's um, you know, maybe four by four um, block region, but actually looking at the individual parcels within the boundaries and it's, it's um, functioning at that parcel specific level. Also an improvement district has some sort of multi-year cost sharing um, plan or program. With the law that was passed in 2000, the, the improvement district actually has to be in place for at least five years, but could be in place for much longer. What was the last term that you assessed at? Was it 10? Uh, we always do five, okay. but I hear that there are neighborhoods in Philadelphia as much as 50. I've heard that as well. And then um, keep in mind that this is a value-added benefit. So the costs are shared by those within the district, but then the benefits are also shared by those within the district. As I mentioned, what's in place right now is Act 130, which was passed in 2000. However, we heard Chuck refer to um, the fact that his improvement district is still actually under the Municipal Authorities Act. We work with improvement districts as well. And there's a senator right now, um, it's actually Senator Costa, is looking to open up the legislation. So even though we're going to be talking about how the law is today as it was passed in 2000, there is some chance that there could be some changes that occur. It probably won't happen in the short term, but there, there could be some changes coming down the pike. When we're looking to create a, a neighborhood improvement district or a business improvement district, um, the municipality has to be on board. And even though this is going to go to, and, and it's, it has to actually go to vote and be approved by the stakeholders and the property owners within the district, the municipality has to approve it. And they can also deny it as well. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, I know the last sentence we have is like a double negative. We say the governing body of the municipality is not required to approve a NID even if the property owners do not object. Basically though, even if the, the property owners want to have this in place, the municipality, city council can still vote it down. And that's gonna be important you know, to look at that as well. However, in most cases with you know, most municipal government, if it's the will of the people and, and those property owners want this to go through, in most cases, it you know, makes sense for it to be passed up by the municipality. Some other things to know is that um, 
there's a plan that's required for this. And the planning process itself, we normally um, a lot around 12 months. It could be a little bit longer, but I would say other things to keep in mind, and I think the mayor had referred to this um, early as well, um, was that any of the proposed revenue sources need to be left listed in the plan that is created solely for this purpose. And that is something to keep in mind. One of the other big differences with the new, with the law of 2000, is that unlike um, in Chuck's case, where currently all of the nonprofit property owners do not pay an assessment fee, there is some ability for the new, from the new law to actually assess nonprofits. The way it's written right now, it's very vague. It can be interpreted lots of different ways. But one thing that we've seen in many of the communities that have formed under this new law is that there's usually some, uh, some assessment fee. We've often seen that they've looked at like a 25% for a nonprofit of what they would normally pay if they weren't a nonprofit. Or there's other ways to have kind of um, payment in lieu of, so maybe a church would provide shared parking versus paying an assessment fee. But there's ways to work around that. Um, but know that there is some flexibility, and, but then there is that ability as well to assess the, the nonprofits. Some other things to keep in mind um, is that the, the duties of the organization and the improvement district are laid out clearly in the plan as well. And um, the, do we have it on there? The municipal services agreement is really important as well because as the mayor had referred to, this is not a replacement of services that already exist within the district, but that it has to be in addition to the current services that are being provided by different activities. And we heard a lot about the activities that are occurring already in, in Westchester and in Reading, but usually it involves hiring some sort of executive staff. We mentioned that um, purchasing, but also leasing property, um, you could provide free, free or reduced parking, if that's an so other activities, and these are some pictures actually from downtown Harrisburg. Harrisburg has an improvement district, and um, one of their problems was the business owners didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know all the different things that the improvement district was really bringing to the district. And what they started to do was identify themselves. The, their ambassadors, their cleanup crew hadn't been identified. It didn't, it not, did, their uniforms did not say Harrisburg Improvement District. And everyone around thought that it was the city doing it. Well, we all know the state of the city of Harrisburg right now. But they you know, started recognizing themselves, wearing the uniform, and all of a sudden now, again, if it talk, you know, we keep going back to value, the perceived value of the program increased tremendously just because people then knew who um, was taking on those activities. They also provide security in Harrisburg, which is a big thing. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to want to be there. So for Harrisburg, that's a large portion of, of what they've taken on within their improvement district. Um, one thing to keep in mind, you know, we mentioned the kind of um, ambassadors, but there, Harrisburg is actually looking at an improvement district in a very residential area in Midtown. And um, they had looked into the possibility of actually hiring additional off-duty police officers to patrol the, the residential areas. And it is something that, as an improvement district, you could also do. Also, within the, the law, you have the opportunity to put a lien against a property that's not paying. And it is something that, obviously, it has political ramifications or could, but it is, uh, you have the power as an improvement district to do that. As far as the approval process, it's laid out in the plan, but um, you know, keep in mind that there is a public hearing that has to be held and that has to be advertised, and there's a 45-day voting uh, time period gets a vote. So if you own 10 different parcels, you would receive 10 different votes. There's lots of different ways to look at that. Those are actually some of the issues that, that we're looking at in, in reopening the bid law. Um, the possibility of, you know, would it be that maybe you actually have to have only 51% for it to go through and it would be treated more like voting positively and more like a, a general election. But as the, the law is written right now, you actually have to have 40% or more voting against for the bid plan to be um, turned down. So, 
these are ways that you um, would vote. Generally, uh, the sole proprietor is the one who has to vote it down. If it's any kind of corporation, the board would have to pass a resolution. If there's a partnership, the um, objection would have to be signed by the partnership, whatever the legal entity of the property owner would be. And um, any different types of organizations, um, <coughs> could be the, the NIDMA, the, the Neighborhood Improvement District Management Association. It could be in some communities. We've had authorities that have been, exist, have been in existence and they've moved then into the nonprofit uh, organization. It could be a community development corporation. As I mentioned, an existing nonprofit in town or um, possibly a new nonprofit that is created specifically for the improvement district. There's different ways, again, according to law, that, that you could create the assessment. It's just want to let you know that in the research that we've performed so far, there's significant evidence that indicates that bids have had um, great success and have improved the business conditions throughout the state and the country. Um, we've heard tonight how some of the bids track their results. Um, we've had some great examples, I think. This map um, just shows a possibility for tentative boundaries for the district. Although the boundaries can change as the planning process unfolds, they need to be estimated up front. Mainly we did this just to understand who to contact during our initial outreach this evening. Um, our next step in the process, um, I'm going to let Julie explain about our focus groups and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, we wanted to try to get an idea of the makeup of the individuals who are at tonight's meeting. So um, there's a couple different categories, and I'll give you the categories beforehand so you know what to expect. We've got those who are just property owners, those who are business owners, let's look at daytime workers, those who have a property and a business, and residents. So out of those four, we talked about this before, but different kinds of, of focus groups depending on the makeup of the, of the community. I mean, I think um, really here with so far who's represented, I think making sure that we can have a, a focus group that would be just around um, merchants or business owners that are tenants who are not property owners. Even though um, you may not have a direct vote, it's still going to be you know, about you and the business and, and being downtown and you certainly have a stake of, for downtown and the health of downtown. So I think um, that will be one group that we're, we'll call together to meet as a focus group. We'll also be meeting then with property owners, and I think that could certainly be property owners and business owners. It doesn't have to be broken down. And then I think maybe we'll talk and, and come up with a third group based off of um, other conversations. I think there were people who couldn't participate tonight who wanted to be part of the discussion. Um, you know, nonprofits, because you have a number of churches and other organizations and associations might be another good fit. Uh, but I think also just to keep the dialogue going. I think one thing that, that I will say in doing this all over Pennsylvania, there's a lot of misconceptions that come up with improvement districts. And, and it's unfortunate because I've only seen the wonderful things that can come out of these types of programs. And you know, I, my hope is that if there are any misconceptions, that we just kind of get them out on the table now and can talk about things. Because again, this is really about you having an opportunity to have a say in what is going on in your community. And I think this is you know, a wonderful model to do that. So I would you know, just open it up and say that you know, maybe we could even just have another <coughs> open forum or if there are specific concerns that you have to bring them um, and we can start addressing that as early as possible. 